laboratory. And uh, I also just wanted to take a minute to acknowledge my ancestors, which are Hickory Apache. I wanna thank you all for joining us to learn about the Great Chaco Canyon region and what you can do to help protect it. This event is co-hosted again by Green Latinos, the National Parks Conservation Association, the Wilderness Society, and we're happy to be joined by Governor, uh, by, excuse me, sir, uh, Vallo, uh of the Pueblo of Acoma and Julia Bernal with the Pueblo Action Alliance. But first, before we get started, we wanna make sure that you keep your microphones muted um, we are going to have an opportunity for you to have Spanish translation in the subtitles along the bottom. You should be able to uh, click those subtitles. We'll start with the discussion with our great speakers. And after uh, that, we'll be accepting questions through the chat box. And then after this discussion, I want you to look for a link to watch the film. It'll be shared in the chat and everyone will be able to navigate to the Bullfrog page to watch uh, the Mysteries of Chaco Canyon. And I'll also share some tips with you to try to avoid any technical snags as you're moving over. With that in mind, let's begin. You know, Chaco Canyon is the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization or UNESCO World Heritage Site, a National Historic Park and a Dark Sky Park. In addition to holding vast cultural resources of indigenous Pueblos people, Today, over two dozen tribes still hold the region sacred, and many use the cultural sites for ceremonies and celebration. This landscape needs to be protected. While oil and gas development threatens these cultural resources, sacred sites, and also the Diné people and the communi other communities that are living in the area who've been dealing with the impacts of oil and gas development for decades. Now, I had a chance to go down uh, to Chaco for the solstice, and I can tell you everywhere around there, it is for sure being exploited by oil and gas. I was shocked by the sheer number of roads that exist just to service what they're doing. And today, again, we're going to be hearing from Governor Brian Vallo with the Pueblo of Acoma and Julia Bernal of the Environmental Justice, uh, who is the Environmental Justice Director with Pueblo Action Alliance to learn more about the Greater Chaco region and what we can do to protect it. And with that, Governor, we'd like to start with you. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Brian Vallo and the governor at the Pueblo of Acoma. I'm very happy to be part of this evening's program and I appreciate the invitation to participate. I am uh, also grateful for this opportunity to share a little bit about the Pueblo of Acoma and our ongoing efforts around um, protecting um, Chaco and its great and sacred landscape, um, while also in the process of doing just that, working very hard to, with others, other tribes and other organizations to ensure that oh, there, is, there are long-term, longer-term protections for the sacred place. <clears throat> and so we've been in partnership with many individuals and organizations and tribes but also our New Mexico congressional leaders and others to ensure that this is a collective effort, that we are doing this together and we are arriving at understandings along the way, better understandings to ensure that we are protecting this very sacred place. The, you know, Chaco Canyon or Wafpa Shaka in our language is a, a place that was settled along the migration of our ancestors. <clears throat> and it was at Chaco where a lot of the, or many things occurred, very significant um, occurrences in our history, our own history that um, occurred at this special place. And there are many, many cultural resources on that landscape that are significant to that were significant not only to our ancestors, but are significant to all of us as Acoma people today. And, uh, and, and many others, uh, other cultures who have a cultural affinity to this area. And so it's for this reason that we, we must protect Chaco. There are many generations of Acoma people and Pueblo people 
yet to come. And so they have and should have the privilege of having and maintaining the connections to Chaco. Even today, we as Akama people, through our prayer, through song and pilgrimage, return to Chaco. There are places on, the, on that landscape beyond the park proper that are critical and crucial components to our own survival and the continuance of our culture. And so the work that we do today is, is very, very important to the sustainability then and the survival of the Akama people. So we, we have invested a tremendous amount of time and resources, really decades of work by Akama and others to ensure that this, these issues are, are brought to the forefront and that we, at, in the end of these processes, have done all that we could in our time to protect the resource. Now, in our recent history, and as a result of ongoing horizontal um, fracking and, and, and the continuous just desecration of land, you know, we are now faced with other um, challenges in this area. And these same issues have been brought to the attention of lawmakers on the federal level and the state level, but also within our respective tribal governments. And you know, it is very unfortunate that as a result of very careless and greed-driven initiatives of the oil and gas industry with support of our own government, that we now have a crisis in the area where the public health um, of those residents, present day residents uh, within the Ch greater Chaco region, that where their health is, is compromised and has been compromised for quite some time. So you combine that with the impacts to the landscape itself, to the air and to the wildlife and plant life that is, we all are still very much dependent on, that when all of that as a collective is compromised, we have to do everything that we can now to ensure that those resources are protected, that those gifts of the creator are protected. You know, one of the challenges that we face um, during, in, in this process of, of advocacy and um, outreach to our lawmakers, both at the federal and state level, is the fact that over time, you know, archaeologists and anthropologists have, you know, uh, what, on, on many different levels have um, tried to understand and create a narrative of this, this very profound history of indigenous people. Um, and of our ancestors. And oftentimes that narrative is, is very much incomplete for the simple fact that we are never really ever consulted or invited to participate in the documentation of um, these areas and the identification of the cultural resources on the, on the landscape beyond uh, what many of those archeologists and anthropologists would um, you know, consider uh, as, as the resources, which are the archeological remnants uh, themselves. But there is so much more than the buildings. There are so much more than the material culture. Our ancestors are buried at these places They're with their associated funerary objects. Our, our cultural leaders of that time placed offerings throughout that landscape. There are many resources that are not known. And so as a result, when federal agencies in this time who are stewards of the land, who are our trustees, continue to 
operate in a fashion where their decision making making is based on incomplete data, incomplete information. That is problematic. And it's been a it's been an issue for for decades now. Now what the, the simple um, remedy to all this, of course, is a commitment then on those federal agencies and others to consult and to reach out to tribes to help them understand that landscape, to help them understand more about our contemporary culture that has direct ties to uh, places like Chaco Canyon. So it's there, there is much to do in this in this area, and unless we have the commitment of the federal government to create narrative and to to develop the the process for for um, uh, creating that data that's so necessary for them in their decision making, um, and unless we're consulted with on a very meaningful level, um, you know, the, the actions of the federal government and influenced by the industry will continue to threaten, if not totally destroy a cultural landscape that, again, is so crucial to the continuance of our uh, Pueblo culture. So we are in this, I suppose, for, for for the, the years ahead until we have achieved two things really for ACOMA. One is that we are supported by the federal government to conduct the ethnographic work and studies that are required to really understand and carefully document the, um, the resources on this landscape, the connections of contemporary Pueblo people and other tribes to, to this landscape. And secondly, to, to really find ways of engaging the federal agents and state agencies and others in more meaningful consultation. It can no longer be just a process of organizing a series of meetings that then result in decisions made by federal agencies, um, you know, absent of, of tribal voice and input. We, that, 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 is not, that is not sustainable. That is not helpful to, to any of us. We need to have the assurances that we will be engaged in a very meaningful way and that we influence the decision-making, that we as stewards as well as have that input, direct input in, in the ways in which then these resources are managed, how they remain accessible to us in the practice of our own indigenous culture, but how then they are safeguarded over the long term from continuous destruction um, and, and also then the human factor, how we protect the residents in that area from the, the continued um, impacts of uh, fracking in, in that area. So there are many things here that um, are, are all very big concerns or big issues. They are ongoing and many people are involved. And we're, we're very grateful that we have these alliances and that in our most recent history, many people have come together, organize, organizations and advocacy uh, groups have, have formed to help us in this important work. Those of us as tribal leaders and cultural practitioners also do our part. And we do that part through prayer. We do that, that part is, is fulfilled through our inherent responsibilities as indigenous people and cultural leaders to protect the space from afar through prayer and, and song. 
But when we do have to return, when we, when we go to the places, when we visit those areas that are crucial um, to the observance of our cultural calendars, at some point we have to, we should arrive at a point where we go to these places, we come onto that landscape without any threat to our, our lives when, while, while being on the landscape. And I hope that future generations of Akama people and other tribal um, groups will have that opportunity. That, that's the bottom line. And, and so we, the Pueblo of Akama remains committed towards this effort and um, I'm grateful that, you know, we also have our allies who are non-Akama. Um, you're going to see a film following this, uh, these presentations um, of which I've had the privilege of uh, serving as an advisory uh, member, committee member um, in the production of these, um, these films about Chaco. And you'll hear firsthand from some Pueblo people uh, who will speak to these same issues around the, the sacredness of Chaco. And um, I, I hope that you will join us in this effort, uh, ongoing effort. And please look out for the, the uh, uh, future, in the very short term future as legislation, which uh, I'm thankful that uh, is receiving bipartisan support uh, this Chaco Protection Bill introduced by Senators Udall and Heinrich of New Mexico. Um, this is one piece of legislation that is so significant and will really set the stage for, I think, a new way of um, approaching um, this preservation effort on the part of uh, all tribes and others who um, uh, have connections to Chaco. So I, I will end here and uh, thank you for again, the opportunity to, to participate in this evening's program. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Vallo. That was a very powerful statement. I found that very moving. In particular, this conversation about prayer from afar. That's a lot of what we're doing is sending you support from afar in your fight. So I just want you to know that I really took that in and thank you so much. And Julia, you're next. Okay, well, um, Hinomo Poyo, the Daikam Gitu, Pap, the Toshe Toyai. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Julia Bernal. I am the Environmental Justice Director of Pueblo Action Alliance, a Pueblo centric grassroots organization in Tiwa territory, otherwise known as present day Albuquerque. Um, before I, before I, go into my perspective about Chaco Canyon. Um, I wanted to thank the Wilderness Society and Green Latinos for, for the invitation to speak at this uh, virtual screening today. Also, Herkim um, to Governor Vio for his continued advocacy and perspective on Chaco Canyon, to the All Pueblo Council of Governors and their staff. Um, and as well as the Greater Chaco Coalition and its participating organizations and community leaders and organizers um, like Kendra Pinto and Cheyenne Antonio. Also, um, a thank you to the Tri Chapter House Coalition and their leadership. And uh, a big um, thank you, Herkim, to Pueblo Action Alliance. Um, we wouldn't be able to achieve the things that we have done over the past couple years without the collectiveness of Pueblo people um, from all different Pueblo communities. Um, we are not just representing one Pueblo, but we have representation of many of our thriving Pueblo communities within our organization. Um, a little about me, I am a, a student of water resources and community planning. Um, I have been studying water 
for about six years now and will forever be a student to water and land um, management. I'm also a water and land protector and I'm really thankful for my experience at Standing Rock that has really galvanized my political and radical perspective when it comes to protecting our sacred places and our cultural resources. Um, since then, my work has been to act on the resurgence of indigenous identity and also the resurgence of an indigenous feminist perspective when it comes to water and land management practices. Um, being a, a woman from San Diego Pueblo, I have my own cultural and spiritual connections to our river, um, known as the Rio Grande, but to us that is our river mother, our Beitla Shirien Kewe'i. And I have dedicated my life to understanding the colonial system that has disenfranchised our non-human relatives. I've spent a lot of time understanding the motivation and advance to displace indigenous communities who have continuously commodified our water and who have continuously exploited our cultural resources. Um, when uh, cultural resources, the dominant paradigm might view as natural resources, which has been the product to fuel this infinite capitalist game. And that is speaking to the entire indigenous global struggle. Indigenous communities from all over the globe have been fighting and fulfilling their responsibility and obligation to protect their lands, their waters, their cultural integrity, so that way future generations to come will also have the birthright to enjoy being Indigenous people as well. I've been involved with Pueblo Action Alliance for about four years now. Um, we're small but mighty, <laughs> and we have been literally building an organization while managing it. Um, and with that, I have been involved in the Greater Chaco movement since Pueblo Action Alliance inception. Um, what was originally more of a cultural and spiritual urgency to protect our sacred place, that is Chaco Canyon, what I learned being involved in the issue is and of course, with my um, interest in, in water resources and also climate change, I learned that it is more than just that. There is a living community that has thrived in this region since time immemorial. I'm talking about the Diné relatives who have made claim to this land. I am also talking about our non-human relatives, the plants and animals that have also spiritual claim to this land as well. And by going up there and visiting Chaco Canyon many times, I have learned the interactions between people, between plants and animals, and their identity to this landscape. And so it became much more of it became much more than just protecting sacred sites. It was about protecting indigenous identity, about refuting colonial systems that have continued to disenfranchise and also belittle the perspective of indigenous people in this area. Much like Governor Vile had mentioned earlier, um, our ecological, our traditional ecological information and genetic legacy has been undermined uh, by the federal government. The fact that it is not deemed important that our perspective and our knowledge be included in cultural assessments and cumulative impact assessments and environmental impact of state, uh, assessments has again, belittled 
the wealth of knowledge and understanding that we have gained from living in this region since time immemorial. We are the original stewards of this land. We have the creativity, the innovation, and also the investment to create communities that thrive, much like how Chaco was a community that was thriving before colonial contact. And so here I am also present to establish again the resurgence and the reclamation of indigenous land practices, of indigenous water protection and management, of indigenous cultural resource management, and that our perspective should be at the forefront because we do have solutions to mitigate climate change. We do have solutions to ensure that all of downstream users have clean water, that have access to water. Nothing on the surface is of our property. That is a colonial state of mind. And if we are able to remove ourselves from the Eurocentric occupation of the mind, body, and soul, I do believe that we can implement change and again, assert our cultural identity. Um, I could definitely talk facts, statistics, numbers, technological information all day, but I'm asserting my stance as a Pueblo feminist who is in those fields for our audience that is viewing today to center indigenous identity when it comes to climate change, to center indigenous identity when it comes to fighting against oil and gas and other non-renewable um, energy fights, whether that's pipelines, whether that's fracking, whether that's logging, whether that's hard rock mineral exploration and exploitation, whether that's nuclear issue related issues, the, ident the indigenous identity and perspective and knowledge needs to be at the forefront of all of these fights because we know this land. We have this genetic memory, the genetic legacy of understanding this land because we have cohabited with the land since time immemorial. So I hope that the messages portrayed by myself and Governor Vio is internalized to the audience viewing today. And I certainly hope to engage with many Pueblo youth to foster their passions um, and foster their their birthright to protect what is theirs. So that way they have a chance to enjoy being indigenous people. So again, thank you. Thank you, Julia. That was also just extremely powerful. I think we so often forget about the animals and the plants and in this moment they're suffering, they're suffering deeply. Uh, we have a couple of questions here that we wanted to start with. And we're hoping that you all could share how the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic has really impacted this process, in particular on tribal consultation. Thank you for that question. Um, COVID has impacted everything. Uh, as you all know, we are impacted on, on many fronts in our personal lives and and most certainly within our respective um, tribal governments. Uh, we have been um, making uh, our voice very clear to the federal agencies, and in this case, the Bureau of Land Management and the Dep Department of Interior, that um, until the, the, the pandemic has um, subsided, you know, we, we, don't, we're, we don't have capacity currently to be actively engaged in the consultation process. And, uh, you know, we have made this very clear to our congressional representatives as well. And um, however, even while this, uh, you know, we are in the middle of this pandemic, 
we have been actively involved in ensuring that um, those issues uh, around an advocacy around the chakra protection bill um, advance, that the dialogue continues and that we remind our, our congressional leaders and other lawmakers that it is very important that this particular piece of legislation um, you know, does see its time on, on, uh, on the, in, the, in the halls of Congress um, and that it, it receives by the bipartisan support that's required for it to be, become law. Um, and also a lot, including that we have been working very hard um, to establish um, a, the process in which we would engage in the ethnog ethnographic work associated with Chaco Canyon. And um, through the efforts of the All Pueblo Council of Governors, uh, we were able to secure um, a federal appropriation to support this ethnographic work on behalf of the Pueblo tribes in New Mexico. Um, so, you know, even, even while there have been some significant setbacks as a result of COVID um, and, and just our ability to, to even be in, in contact with one another, and especially, you know, most of our tribes who, and our Pueblo communities, including Acoma, who have a historic preservation office and who have a tribal historic preservation officer, you know, because we are, our, our tribal organizations are still closed um, and they're not necessarily considered essential employees, you know, we don't have our experts readily accessible to have the consultation. And, and even while we have made this very clear to, to the agency, they have continued to tread forward. Um, so uh, this is uh, just a very uh, great disappointment because then you know, a lot is lost in that process. And, and certainly, um, you know, when, when all of the, the key individuals from the respective tribes cannot be at the table, there is a significant uh, problem then um, and it likely to lead to more, even more work and controversy and um, you know, uh, poor decision making as a result of not giving ourselves the opportunity to um, you know, let the pandemic pass and um, afford ourselves that opportunity and right to have meaningful consultation. Julia, did you want to add anything? Um, we've seen in this administration how advantageous and opportunist um, oil and gas, um, it's been prioritized, you know, by, by this administration. Um, I only see that during this pandemic, it was seen as a in a way to advance streamlining processes, streamlining permits, um, streamlining um, land parcel auctions to continue this fossil fuel dependency. Um, and with this draft resource management plan amendment, um, it doesn't include any sort of language that talks about just transition or talks about collaborative, meaningful collaboration and consultation with tribal governments. So there was never an intention to strengthen the relationship with the sovereign nations here in New Mexico. COVID-19 um, was something that I don't think many of us were prepared for, but that didn't mean that climate change wasn't was on on pause. I didn't mean that um, the the addiction to fossil fuel and then its economy didn't stop either. Um, it only made us realize how um, untrustworthy these systems have been towards us. Um, 
I agree with everything that um, Governor Vio just spoke to. And I hope that, you know, during this time, we can start thinking more long term. Um, we can start thinking more long term about what our sovereign nations are going to do to ensure like the health and safety of our communities that will ensure, you know, access to um, not just resources like water and but also access to, you know, broadband and um, access to different types of institutions like libraries and schools and, you know, uh, things that a lot of our rural indigenous communities do not have privy to. Um, and that was something that wasn't considered by the federal government. We all are moving on to these virtual platforms. I mean, much like this one right now. And I know that a lot of my relatives won't be able to see this video because of their lack of access to broadband. It's something to really consider looking forward, but I do hope that it asserts more long-term visions when it comes to making sure that our communities are, uh, are protected, but also have the things that they need. Well, thank you so much, Julia. I, you really struck me with climate change did not slow down. In fact, I feel like it perhaps in some ways it doubled down because these industries use this opportunity while we were at, while you were at home, because honestly, people of color were out and at work and being exposed and didn't have the privilege to be at home. Um, the environmental injustice and pollution continued. And I think you just make a really good point there. We have time for one more question. And that question is, what can people who are not indigenous to your land do to help support you in this time? Julia, um, can I ask you to take that one? I mean, this is right up your alley. <laughs> <laughs> um, sure. I just wanted to, you know, give you space out of respect. But um, I, I uh, you know, I, it's important that our projects, our startup organizations, our education is, is essentially is funded. Uh, I mean, we are just the most disenfranchised population of people, you know, in, in this country. We, we don't have the opportunities, we don't have the privilege that a lot of people um, have when it comes to uh, conservation, when it comes to land and water management. I consider myself a very privileged person that I have been able to access education, that I have, um, that I have, uh, you know, that I grew up in San Diego Pueblo and I was near, you know, resources and being next to Albuquerque. Um, you know, I consider myself privileged and if you're a non-indigenous person, uh, more so if you're, if you're a, a white person, you have 10 steps ahead. <laughs> you have a privilege that you should acknowledge and understand because indigenous peoples, we are going to be the frontline communities that experience climate change the fastest. Chaco Canyon is an example of how frontline indigenous communities are experiencing the impacts of climate change first. We think about our relatives that live along the, that have made their homes for generations along the shorelines that are now having to start planning around rising sea levels. We have our relatives in the Arctic refuge who are seeing right before their eyes the effects of climate change as their glaciers are melting as their um, caribou herds are becoming more sparse i mean we are the people that live on the land and we see and we observe and we know that change is happening our struggle our perspective and our knowledge needs to be at the center of all of these all of these environmental and social injustices. Let me just let me just add that I think one way that we can all contribute in this in the very short term is if you are a registered voter, please vote. 
we have to have we have to see change at that level at, at the, on the federal level uh, because if this current administration is given the opportunity to continue its agenda, Chaco will continue to be threatened. So I encourage everyone to go out and vote, make some good decisions, but also to follow the legislation, um, the Chaco Protection Bill, which is designed to, um, you know, create the and, and maintain the 10 mile buffer zone, um, which is something that all of the tribes agreed would be in the best interest of, of the, the, uh, that landscape. You know, that, you know, write your congressmen, write, write, write your, your, your senators and let them know that, you know, the supporting that piece of legislation is, is so critical to the long-term uh, protection of this cultural resource. Thank you. Thank you so much to Governor Vallo and Julia for joining us today and sharing so much with us. You know, I, I can speak from personal experience that I have never seen the sun so large as I saw it coming over the cliffs uh, on the solstice in this place. And I knew that it was something that was important for us all to join in and protecting you know, currently Chaco Canyon is threatened by encroaching oil and gas development, and we need you to send a comment to the Bureau of Land Management today, telling them to, to protect the greater Chaco Canyon region from oil and gas development. All you need to do is click the link in this chat box. It should be in there now. And I'm here to tell you if all 200 of us on here tell five people, that's 1,000 comments. If we all tell 10 people in the next four days, that's 2,000 comments. Uh, I believe that this is a human rights issue and these people all people have the right to honor our ancestors and those that are kept in these sacred spaces and so i really ask you to get outside of your comfort zone maybe you tell 20 people but that's what it's going to take for us to stop this action and to do the right thing now we're going to navigate to the bullfrog productions page to watch the mystery of chuckle canyon oh i do have one note here i do want to say thank you to our translator teresa uh, I think that this conversation about environmental justice also begins with language justice. And we're doing our best with Green Latinos uh, to support any organization that wants to work towards language justice. And Green Latinos stand strong in honoring treaties and tribal cons uh, consultation. So there's some things that you can put into your comments. The film uh, screening room link has been pasted in the chat. And once you get there, you will need to enter a video password uh, it is a zero in this password, not an O. And we recommend that the viewers copy and paste the video password uh, to make sure that you get in. And for tips for best quality, you can use Chrome or Firefox on your browser. Make sure to close all other tabs. Or if you're using a smartphone, close other tabs and windows for the best video quality. Uh, and make sure you disable your pop-up blocker. If the feed does not start within 30 seconds of screen time, we recommend that viewers refresh their browsing window Troubleshooting uh, tips can be found in the FAQ link that they're dropping in the chat now, titled Troubleshooting FAQ. We will have a live representative uh, to stay on this Zoom if you are having technical questions or support. And you can also reach info at bullfrogcommunities.com. Do not hesitate to ask for tech support. We want to make sure that all of you have the great opportunity to learn more about this sacred place. And we hope that you will stay connected to us in this work and stay connected to these people and to our other relatives, the animals and the plants that were discussed today. So thank you.